So if you have children who have reached the age of five, there is a very strong chance that they have already been evolutionized. And the reason I say that is because there's not too many young children who are not absolutely fascinated with the dinosaurs. Kids love them. And if you stop and think about what is the very first introduction most children have into the godless theory of evolution, it's dinosaurs. And you think about how fascinated they are. They learn their names. They they fill up our homes with plastic figurines. In fact, I I tell parents, if you haven't stepped on a plastic dinosaur figurine in the middle of the night, you're not qualified yet, okay? Because the pain from that is only second to one other thing. Legos, that's right. (laughs) Kids love them. They learn their names. They learn what they look like, all the different facts about them. But it's not just children that love dinosaurs. We adults also have a fascination with them. And as a result, magazines, they love to put their picture on the cover because they know when they do that, they're almost guaranteed increased sales. And so they'll tell us things like where the fossils were discovered, what they think they were eating, all the different factoids about them. Like, for instance, this guy right here, the Argentinosaurus, one of the largest they've ever discovered supposedly weighed 110 tons. Bet you can't guess where they found him. Texas. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) They'd like to think so. If you want to see a replica of this guy, you've got to go to the Fernbank Museum in Atlanta, where he stretches literally from one end of the museum to the next. Now, just to give you a really good idea how big this guy was, if you look at the screen, for a minute right over here on the right that's a full-size t-rex that doesn't come up to this guy's hip bone he was massive and yet it's because of these same dinosaurs that in too many cases we're losing our kids because what usually happens is age five six seven eight they learn all this stuff And they don't realize at that tender age that, hey, that doesn't really fit this. And so they compartmentalize. And on Sundays, they come to Bible class, and they hear sermons, and they learn things. And all throughout the rest of the week, they're hearing millions and billions. And then Sunday, they come back, and they learn a Bible story. Over and over, this happens until they hit about 18 or 19 And they run off to college, and some guy with a lot of initials after his name, wearing a starched white lab coat, ridicules this book and basically reminds them, hey, you you know the dinosaurs walked the earth millions of years ago? And all of a sudden, that child has to figure out which one he's going to believe. In fact, here's what I want to do. I want to walk through the life of a child in this congregation okay we're we're going to start about age three when mom and dad start buying all that dinosaur paraphernalia the games the figurines in fact some of you grandparents in this room you are guilty and the fascination begins you hit about age four It is a cold winter morning in Oklahoma. Mom, she's over there. She's stirring up some instant oatmeal. All the while, that child is reading the package, and they're learning about evolution. They hit age five. Now they want snacks. So what do we do? We we get them snacks, and they learn about evolution. They hit about age seven. Finally old enough to take them out to a a fine dining establishment. So we load them up. We take them in the car to Wendy's. You can tell I have four kids, right? In fact, we just go through the drive-thru. And yet, on their little kid's meal bag, you know what it's teaching? It's teaching about evolution. Or maybe your child, maybe your child doesn't like Wendy's. Maybe they like, say, Arby's instead. 
But again, they're learning about evolution. They get a little bit older. Now they're eight, nine. They start taking field trips to museums, places like Oklahoma City or, or down to Dallas, where they're being told about these vast old ages, the Triassic, the Jurassic period. Or maybe they go somewhere like the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. Or maybe they go to the Fernbank Museum in Atlanta. Or maybe, maybe they go to Chicago to the Field Museum where Sue is on display. Now, I, I want to stop right there, and I want to just simply ask the parents in this room, how many of the, the parents of these children do you think actually thought about what their children would be reading on those placards when they signed the permission slip to go on that field trip? Because I took that picture, and I also took a picture of what they're reading on the placard, and folks, there is no way to harmonize what they're reading with this right here. They get a little bit older. Now they're eight, nine, ten. They start reading chapter books, like the Magic School Bus. In fact, how many of you in here are familiar with the Magic School Bus? Let me see your hands for just a second. Okay. Oh, we got some older readers. I like that. That's good. Very popular kid series. But notice on this particular one, it's got a picture of a boy. He's holding this picture of a dinosaur chasing a caveman. But notice what the text says. Little boy says, this story is make-believe. His friend says, there were no dinosaurs in the time of cave people. In fact, top left corner says, no people ever saw a dinosaur. When early humans appeared on the earth, dinosaurs had already been dead for millions of years. Or how about this one? Maybe, maybe you like the Magic Tree House. Again, very popular kids series. This time, you don't even actually get into the book. You're still in the introduction. It's telling you dinosaurs lived millions of years ago, and then notice what it adds. Human beings, of course, had not yet evolved. Right in the middle of this particular book, they've got a timeline. Dinosaurs living in the Triassic, the Jurassic period. And then finally, way down here, comes humans. Now, as you look at that timeline, let me just plant a verse from Jesus Christ in your head. Mark chapter 10, verse 6. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. How do you harmonize Jesus' words with that right there? You don't. You see, quite literally from the very first grade, most textbooks have been indoctrinating them into this godless theory. Now, let me make sure everybody in the room understands what the real dilemma is. So, now most textbooks are teaching that dinosaurs died out about 65 million years ago, and we came along allegedly carrying our clubs about 3 million years ago. But if I were to ask you, is that what this book teaches? Nope. This book teaches that there was a six-day creation. Now, let's break it down even tighter than that. What day were all land-dwelling creatures created on? Land-dwelling creatures. There you go. Land-dwellers, day six. What day was man created on? Day six. That means we would actually have to coexist. Folks, if you believe the Bible is inspired and you believe there was a six-day creation that God created everything, there's no other way around it. Now, I know right now there's one or two of you in this room thinking, there's no way we could like coexist. I'm going to prove it to you. But I need you to understand, if the Bible is true, and it is, and we had to coexist. National Geographic several years ago asked a question or, or made this statement. They said, no human being has ever seen a live dinosaur. Tonight we're going to look at some evidence that's going to make that look like a comic book. 
First question we've got to answer is this. Did they really exist? The answer, absolutely. We have found their fossilized remains on all seven continents, Arctic to Antarctic and everywhere in between. Moms and dads, it does not do your children any favors to say, well, I think they were just mythological. Because what happens if you teach them that and then they come face to face with a two-story tall T-Rex skeleton? They really did exist. The question is not, in fact, I had a friend of mine, came back from Antarctica, called me up, he said, guess what we just discovered in Antarctica? More dinosaur fossils. Another occasion, I was getting off a plane coming from Oregon. I had a, a preacher friend, he called me, he said, hey, we need you to come to our church. I thought he meant to speak. He said, no. No, no, he said, we got bones. It's like, what are y'all doing? <laughs> like, okay, I've heard of people passing snakes, but y'all are like taking it to a whole new level. Sure enough, they were actually digging an elevator shaft. They were making an addition to their building. In the bottom of that massive hole, we found all kinds of bones. We took hours and hours digging them out, measuring them, taking pictures, in fact, I tell people, in this computer right here, which, by the way, Stephen, I swapped them. I hope that's okay. In this computer right here, I got all kinds of pictures. I tell people, you don't think there are dinosaurs in the church? I got pictures on them, okay? <laughs> question is not, did they exist? The real question is when. Was it millions and millions of years ago, or is it possible that they've been around more recently. Now, before I share the evidence with you, I do need to give you about a one or two minute history lesson, okay? And I know I got some homeschool kids in this room, so get out your journals and start writing. No, I'm just teasing. I, we homeschooled my kids, so I can say that. The word dinosaur itself came into existence in the year 1845. I want everybody to put that right up here, write it down. Remember the year 1845. Guy by the name of Sir Richard Owen, he actually coined the term. He made up the term dinosaur. He used two Greek words, dinos, soros, translated by him as fearfully great lizard. That was in 1845. Now, those of you in this room who know your history, you know, that was around the time of the great dinosaur wars when you've got, for instance, Marsh and, and his, his colleague, they're, they're collecting as many dinosaurs as they can. They're naming them. 1845. That's really when our fascination began. And as I said, the question is not did they exist? The real question is when? Let's start looking in 2013 when scientists discovered not a fossil but skin pliable skin from a hydrosaur now why is that a big deal <laughs> that's a pretty big deal because soft tissue doesn't stick around for 65 million years and yet you've got tissue that is well preserved enough they're now drawing colors from it or, or how about this one? 1967, Robert Lipscomb. He discovered bones in Alaska from a dinosaur. That's a good, cool thing. But these weren't fossils. These were just frozen. Still had blood supply in it. Or how about this one? 2005, American researchers very quietly announced that they had found a fossilized mammal that had a dinosaur in its belly that it had eaten. Now you say, okay, well, so what? What's the big deal? Don't forget the whole evolutionary timeline. According to them, cold-blooded dinosaurs eventually gave rise to warm-blooded mammals, which gave rise... And yet, you got evidence of mammals eating them? Yeah. Or how how about this Mesopotamian cylinder seal? Dug out of the ground, looks an awful lot like what you and I would call an apatosaurus. 
Or while we're down there digging, let's go over to where the pyramids are to Egypt, where they found these two tablets, both of which have got dinosaur-like creatures on them. These tablets attributed an armor, the legendary first pharaoh of United Egypt. The next one is one of my favorites. Cambodia. Buddhist temple. Uncovered about 16, 17 years ago. So picture in your mind this jungle area completely overrun with vegetation. They discover this temple. They came in with what you and I would call industrial strength roundup. Killed everything. They discovered this temple, eight to nine hundred year old Buddhist temple. And as they're peeling back everything, they realize all these elegant carvings on it. For instance, if you look carefully at the screen, this guy right here, that's a monkey. You see his face, his front legs, his back legs, his tail kind of goes up behind his head. This guy right here, some of you may have on your wall. That would be a deer. You see his antlers, his tail in the up position. But the artist didn't just stop with things like monkeys and deer. He also carved things like dinosaurs. So well carved that a 10-year-old child can tell me what kind that is. That's actually a stegosaurus. Now, I, I'm kind of trained in, in science. I love firsthand data. Had a friend who was going to Cambodia. I said, look, you have got to get me firsthand pictures. And he did. These are some of his. But it, he told me, he said, Brad, as we're taking this tour, he said, we came up to one of the columns that had dinosaurs on it. He said, I'm snapping shots for you. He said, I turned to the tour guide and I asked him, I said, hey, how do you guys explain this? He said, the tour guide's exact words were, I know what you're thinking, but we're supposed to tell you it's a porcupine. <laughs> I've seen porcupines before. That don't look like one. Or maybe somebody could explain to me the Ica stones of Peru. A gentleman by the name of Dr. Javier Cabrera was given one of these stones as a birthday gift. Native farmer there in Peru gave it to him. He noticed it had these elegant carvings on it. So he asked the farmer, he said, hey, where'd you get this? The farmer explained that these were burial stones that the ancient Incan Indians used to find inside the tombs. They would place them in the tombs of their loved ones. So if you look carefully, you'll notice... You've got the dead guy over here, burial stone right there. Dr. Cabrera set out to find as many of these stones as he could. He and his team would open up the Incan tomb, collect the burial stones. All told, they found about 11,000 of them. Roughly a third of these burial stones have got very elegant pictures of dinosaurs on them. And not just dinosaurs, in many cases, they actually have dinosaurs and men. Or maybe somebody could explain to me the dinosaur figurines from Acambaro, Mexico. A gentleman, he was riding on the back of a horse around the, the foothills of the El Toro Mountains. And from that elevated position, he looked down, he saw the first of these little ceramic figurines. They actually started digging. They realized, there's a whole civilization used to live here. And in their digging, they turned up about 30,000 of these. Or maybe somebody could explain to me the petroglyphs, the Natural Bridges National Monument. If you were to go there today, just outside of Blanding, Utah, there are three of those natural sandstone bridges, one of which is called Kachina. It's on that particular bridge that the Anasazi Indians, they used to, to carve all kinds of things. You can go there today, you can see things like bighorn sheep, and you can see things like dinosaurs. Question, 
How did they know what to carve if they'd never seen one of these creatures? Or maybe somebody could explain to me the textiles in Peru that look, again, an awful lot like what you and I would call a dinosaur. Or let's do this. Let's, let's hop on a plane. Let's go over to, to Europe, to the UK. And go up through the Lake District. You'll find a little city called Carlisle. And it's in that particular city, this cathedral is sitting right in the middle. That cathedral is actually older than the United States of America. And the reason I know that is because there are people buried in the floor. Like, for instance, Richard Bell, his tomb is buried below that carpet. He died in 1496. He's not the oldest one in the floor. Now, when did I say the word dinosaur was actually coined? 1845. This guy died in round numbers 350 years before the word dinosaur even came into existence. But if you have them roll up that protective carpet, they put it there because the, the bronze was starting to wear away. If you have them roll that up for you, or if you have four small children that'll do it for you and don't know any better, and you get down on your hands and your knees and you start looking, you're going to see things like dogs, fish, and dinosaurs. 350 years before the word actually even came into existence. Or, or maybe you could explain this Mayan base. Or, or the discovery made by Dr. Samuel Hubbard. Dr. Samuel Hubbard set out on an expedition many, many years ago to prove the American Indians had been on this continent much longer than we were giving them credit for. You can look it up called the Doheny Scientific Expedition. He went down into the Grand Canyon looking for things like their pottery, their clothing, eventually made his way down the Havasupai Canyon. And he was looking for any evidence that the Indians had been here. And lo and behold, he found his evidence. He found their pottery, he found their clothing, but he also found their cave art. Now, etched into some of those canyon walls, there were pictures that had taken men quite literally hours to carve out by hand. You say, all right, Brad, pictures of what? Well, let's see. There was buffalo, sheep, dinosaurs, oxen, men. <laughs> Run that list by me one more time. Buffalo, sheep, oxen, men, and dinosaurs. In fact, I want you to read with me what Dr. Hubbard had to say regarding his find. He said, taking all in all, the proportions are good. The huge reptile is depicted in the attitude in which man would most likely see it. Reared on its hind legs, balancing with a long tail, either feeding or in a fighting position, possibly defending itself against a party of men. He goes on to say, the fact that some prehistoric man made a pictograph of a dinosaur on the walls of this canyon upsets completely all of our theories regarding the antiquity of man. The fact that the animal is upright and balanced on his tail would seem to indicate that the prehistoric artist must have seen it alive. Now, I brought a picture of what Dr. Hubbard discovered. And I hate to be the one to break it to you. That right there is not an ox. It's not a sheep. But it's an awfully good representation of a dinosaur we now know existed called the Edmontosaurus. How in the world did they know what that thing looked like if they'd never seen it? Now, I know what some of you are thinking. There's at least one or two of you in this room thinking, all right, bro, all this is good, but you don't understand. I work with some really hard-headed people, and they need like two-by-four-across-the-head kind of evidence. 
which is good. That's okay because we've got that as well. Like, for instance, what about, what about the soft tissue we're finding? Some of you probably heard 2005, uh, a lady by the name of Mary Schweitzer kind of dropped a, a bomb in the evolutionary camp. I actually talked to her. She shared with me what happened. She said it was really by mistake that they made this discovery at all. She said, we were digging in the Hell Creek Formation in Montana. She said, we uncovered a, a, a massive T-Rex femur. She said, we wanted to take it back to the lab, so here's what we did. We completely uncovered it, encased it in what you and I would call plaster Paris. It was a, a protective block. She said, we rented a helicopter. When the helicopter came and landed, <laughs> she said, that's when we realized our mistake because that block was too big to fit in the helicopter. And she said, if you think renting a taxi cab in New York City is expensive, try renting a helicopter in Montana. She said, we realized we were gonna have to do something very quick, so we decided to cut it right in half. And when we did that, we could actually turn this bone and look inside where we found soft tissue, blood vessels, and what she thinks blood cells. Now hopefully I don't have to tell everybody in this room, soft tissue, blood vessels, blood cells, they don't stick around for 65 million years. One of the reasons I know that, I got my doctor from the University of Tennessee Medical School. You know what UT is known for? There's, there's, besides football, whatever, I, they got something called the body farm. You know what the body farm is? It's actually the biggest decomposition database in the world. Basically what happens is somebody over in, for instance, London, they call, they say, hey, we just discovered a body. Can you tell us how long it's been dead? They tell them the parameters, they shoot pictures of it. They will then take a human cadaver, put it under the same conditions on the body farm, and they start to record everything about it. They built the best decomposition database in the world. And folks, I'm telling you, if we got soft tissue, blood vessels, blood cells, that thing ain't been dead 65 million years. DNA, the half-life of DNA by itself, not that old. I asked her a question. I said, why do you think we've never found soft tissue in dinosaur bones before? We actually had, didn't know that when I talked to her, but her answer kind of sent a, a chill right up my spine. She said, maybe because we've never thought to look. Now think about that for just a minute. You find a dinosaur bone? That used to be like the prize, right? Imagine me coming up with a hammer saying, let's bust that open. No. And yet now we know there's actually a bigger prize inside. Since Mary Schweitzer's discovery, there have been 16 additional dinosaur fossils with soft tissue. 16. They're not going away. Several years ago, I took my middle son on a a dinosaur dig to the Hell Creek Formation in Montana. I, I tell people, if you want to see dinosaur stuff, that's where you need to go, okay? It is like dinosaur utopia. There are footprints, there's all kind of stuff. We got permission from a, a lady. She had thousands of acres. We got permission to, to film a documentary on her ranch. Her name was Marge. I called her before we went. I said, Marge, here's the deal. I said, I'm a creationist. I don't think dinosaurs have been dead that long. I'd like to come out and, and film some stuff on your property. And she said, oh, sugar, I know they ain't been dead that long. She said, I got the goods on them. I thought Marge was joking. Marge has a better museum all around her house than in some of the, I've been to most of the museums in the world, okay? got more stuff than you can imagine. She said, you just come on out. Bring your kids. Now, I would show you some video of Marge, okay? 
But Marge's language is kind of a mixture between a sailor and a Cajun. Okay, it's kind of spicy. We get there, and she starts showing my kids how to identify scales, teeth. We, we found dinosaur bones, all kinds of really cool stuff while we're there. But while we're there, so we had two, two vehicles, two suburban, camera crew in one, we're in the other. We're driving from one side of her ranch to the other. She points over to a ridge and she says, you see that right there? That's where Mark found his triceratops horn. Now, I know God is amazing, but I'm sitting there thinking there is no way she's talking about the same Mark that I'm thinking about. I looked at her and said, you're not talking about Mark Armitage, are you? She said, yeah, right over there. That, that's where he found his triceratops horn. Now, I knew who she was talking about because I'd been reading about this guy for months. This is a guy who for more than 20 years, he worked in a California laboratory as a microscopist at one of the universities. He found this soft tissue got it published in a peer-reviewed journal, and the day that it came out, they fired him. In fact, one of the guys walked into his lab and said, we will not have your religion in our department. Now think about that for just a minute. He never mentioned God, never mentioned creation. All he did was quite literally report what he found. Now, folks, I got a problem with that. Because normally what's supposed to happen in science is you make a theory. If you get evidence in that disproves the theory, you don't throw the evidence out. You throw the theory out. And yet, at this point, this theory has become their religion. And they are willing to bend their observations to fit it. I asked Marge, I said, hey, can we, can we go see that? She's like, yeah. So we head off across the field. We get over there. Sure enough, you can see perfectly where they lifted this triceratops horn from. It was about that time that Marge whipped out gallon-sized Ziploc bags and handed them to us and said, hey, you guys find any, anything you want to take home, you just take it home with you. Which, if you know anything about archaeology, that's a pretty big deal. Okay, because you normally don't get to keep squat. We're like throwing everything we can find in these gallons of block bags. So we're all standing there. I, I have four children. Okay, I have three scruffy boys and one princess. And for whatever reason, my daughter Claire wrapped Marge around her finger. I watched Marge go over to the back of one of the Suburbans Take out, you know those old plastic ice cream buckets? The big one. She had one packed so full, the top literally was bulging over, full of dinosaur bones, vertebra, fossils, teeth, skin impressions. Hands it off to my daughter and says, here, sugar, you just take us home with you. To which I was like, give that to your daddy. <laughs> We're standing there, and all of a sudden, I hear Marge say this. Um, you know, Brad, I've got Mark's telephone number. At which point, I kind of became like a teenage girl at a Taylor Swift concert. I was kind of like, just seriously, she's like, yeah, you ought to call him. So I did. I said, Mark, you don't know me. I'm a creationist. We're putting together a documentary. I would love to interview you. I said, I don't think dinosaurs have been dead that long. He interrupted me. He said, oh, they haven't. He said, I've got microscopic evidence they haven't. He said, tell you what, Brad, I'm speaking in California. If you can be there, I'll not only let you interview me. He said, I'll bring some soft tissue. You can play with it. So I did. In fact, he did bring his microscope. He brought soft tissue from a dinosaur that was so flexible, I took two pair of tweezers and was able to do this with it. Now, to give you an idea of what this guy has, 
He has cells so well preserved that he's had two labs offer to culture them. Now, let me make sure you understand what that means. That means they think they can make it grow. Folks, if you're making stuff grow, it ain't been dead 65 million years. In fact, he's got nerve tissue. He's quite literally, uh, he and I talk usually about once every two to three months. He kind of gives me an update. He's now formed something called the, I'll see if it's on this, DSTRI, which stands for Dinosaur Soft Tissue Research Institute. Um, this was a paper he actually got published last year where they found a blood clot. If you want to look him up, look him up. Again, his name is Mark Armitage, Dinosaur Soft Tissue Research Institute. He is on Facebook. He would love for you to ask him about his stuff. I've got a an opportunity to maybe do some research with him this fall. Really, really fired up. I, I, could, I could stand here and show you guys slide after slide after slide proving, yeah, we really did coexist with him. I am going to show you one more just because I, I think it makes the point pretty well. If you look on the screen, this is a three-toed dinosaur track. But look in the front of it. That would be a five-toed human track. This one, by the way, has actually been verified by a spiral CT scan. It's the real McCoy. How do you get a human footprint and a dinosaur track in the same striatal layer if we're separated by 65 million years? You can't. Somebody says, all right, then... Brad, why aren't they mentioned in the Bible? That's not a fair question. And the reason I say that's not a fair question, when did I say the word dinosaur was actually coined? 1845. When was your Bible translated into English? 1611. King James Version, 1611. How in the world would you get the word dinosaur in this book if it doesn't come along for another 200 plus years? You know, a better question would be for you to ask me, is there compelling evidence of dinosaur-like creatures in this book? And to that I would say, turn with me to the book of Job. I, I don't know if Stephen gives homework. I'm giving you homework tonight. You can find these same creatures in the book of Isaiah. In the book of Psalm, don't ask me during the Q&A where in Isaiah or Psalm, okay? That's your homework. I don't get participation awards. I, I love the book of Job for multiple reasons. One of the reasons I love it is because at the end of the day, what Job really teaches us is humility. And every person in this room, whether we like it or not, every once in a while we need a good dose of it. We need to be reminded that God is God and we're not, right? You guys remember the very first chapter, Job basically loses everything. He loses his flocks, his wealth. His, I mean, they're literally tapping their own shoulders. Hey, all your sheep are gone. Hey, all your... And as they're doing that, somebody else comes up and says, Hey, your children, they were taken out too. But thankfully, he's got a very supportive wife. Some of you have read Job. <laughs> if you look at Job chapter 2, verse 9, Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. You just got to love a supportive wife. <laughs> but he doesn't do that. Instead, what we find in the rest of this book is Job's three friends come on the scene. Now, I... I put them in quotes on purpose because they're not really what you and I would call friends. What they really are is nosy busybodies. Okay? You may know somebody like that. Don't look at them right now. You know who I'm talking about. Okay? These are people who got to know what's going on. They assume Job sinned big time. And that God is paying them back. And so you know what they really want to know? 
what'd you do? And for the next 25 plus chapters, you're going to read this running dialogue between Job and these three friends. Basically, it kind of goes like this. Eliphaz steps up and says, wow, Job, man, you need to repent. What'd you do? Job says, I didn't do anything. Friend number two, Bildad tags in and says, ah, come on now, Job. We're your friends. You can tell us. What'd you do? He says, I, I didn't do anything. Friend number three, Zophar, steps up and says, now come on, Job. We can tell from your life you, you've offended God. You need to repent. What, what did you do? Until finally, in a fit of anger, Job burst out and he actually makes a request to speak to God. If you look in Job chapter 13, verse 22, he says, and you call and I will answer, you let me speak, then you respond to me. He's basically telling God, you can go first or I'll go first. Well, in Job chapter 38, we have God's response. Job chapter 38, verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you and you will answer me. God's saying, you want to talk, big boy? <laughs> yeah, we're going to talk, but I'm going to be the one doing all the talking. And for the next four chapters, God deluges Job with question after question after question. Young people in this room, if you have never read Job 4, 38 through 41, go home and read it. He starts out by saying, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth, Job? Job, where's the dwelling place of light? Job, how, how do I make snow and hail? Job, what about the eagle and the hawk? How do they fly? Job, what, what about the behemoth? Job chapter 40, verse 15. Look now at the behemoth, which I made along with you. He eats grass like an ox. See now his strength is in his stomach muscles. He moves his tail like a cedar. What in the, what, what's a behemoth? And somebody says, well, Brad, I'm so glad you're here because my Bible tells you. I, I got a little footnote that says that this is either a hippopotamus or an elephant. To which I would very gently remind you, your footnotes are not inspired. But I, I'll go along with you for a minute. Let's, let's look at the description of this creature. In verse 16 it says, Lo, now his strength is in his loins, the force is in the navel of his belly. So obviously, whatever creature we're talking about had a, a large belly, right? That guy have a big belly? Yep. That guy have a big belly? Yep. That guy have a big belly? Yep. Keep reading. Verse 17. He moveth his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his stones are wrapped together. And when it's talking about cedars here, it's talking about some of the largest of trees. In fact, when I teach preaching students, I always tell them, picture in your mind going to the northwest sector of this country where the, the redwoods, the sequoias are, the ones you can't get your hands around. And you say, Brad, how do, how do you know that? Well, if you do a little word study, in the Bible, on this word cedar, here's what you're going to find out. You're going to find out that word cedar, those were the ones that were used to build the temple, right? The cedars of Lebanon. These were massive trees. And yet God is describing this creature. He says, he moves his tail like a cedar. Here's a question for you. That look like a cedar to anybody in the room? Not exactly. How about that? Not exactly. That's getting a whole lot closer, isn't it? Somebody says, okay, Brad, I, I hear everything you've said so far, but we got a problem. Because you're going to stand up there and teach us that God created man and dinosaurs on day six. No other way around it. Then we're to read about this behemoth in Job chapter 40 
the Leviathan in Job chapter 41, Job is a post-flood book. Now, we think it's one of the earliest books written, but the events of Job actually took place after the flood. I mean, wouldn't that mean, yep, they had to be on that boat. Now, before you pack me off and send me to a nice little rubber room, give me just a moment or two to explain some things. I, I'll go ahead and tell you guys, I love teaching on the flood, okay? When I say I love teaching on the flood, what I'm saying is, I could go three hours, you give me a bottle of water, I could go three hours without any problem. My wife was sitting here, she'd be like, yeah, he can. I'm not, okay, I promise, <laughs> I'm going to let you go. I, I went back like three or four years ago, restudied it, found a whole lot of good new stuff I'd never seen before. Amazing, by the way, when you go back and read the Bible more, you keep finding things, don't you? I am going to ask you a couple questions. Number one, basic question, who created all the animals? Don't you think he knows how big a boat he needs for the animals he created? Question number two, did Noah have to take adult animals on the boat? Could he have taken juveniles? Well, let's think about it. What was the purpose of the animals when they got off the boat? It was to replenish the earth, right? So does it make sense to everybody in this room, you would want to have animals that have a long reproductive life ahead of them, right? I don't mean any disrespect to anybody in this room, but I don't think there was a single animal getting on that boat holding an AARP card. I don't think it happened. You ever seen what a dinosaur comes from? An egg. The largest dinosaur egg we've ever discovered would fit very cleanly in both of my hands. So is it possible God allowed Noah to take juvenile dinosaurs? Oh yeah. Folks, not only is it possible, I think the evidence I've shown you tonight proves it, that they were here after the flood. I, I used to travel with two things. Everywhere I went, I, I would take a dinosaur egg and one of the Ica stones. We actually got a real one. There are some fakes out there. We got a real one from the Cabrera family. And so I would take them and I would set them out and just let people look at them, hold them, touch them. Because think about it, it's, it's kind of cool to be able to see stuff and touch it firsthand. Then 9-11 happened. And going through an airport became an ordeal. I told my wife, it's like my weekly massage to pat you down. And every time, I always carried them in my flight bag because I wanted to have them pretty close. You'd, it's not a value thing as much as they just can't replace it, right? So every weekend, here's what would happen. I would go through TSA, I'd get on the other side, and there'd be somebody holding them saying, what's this? Now, if you are from Arkansas, let me go ahead and repent, okay? I don't meet me outside in the parking lot. True story. I'm going through Little Rock, right? I get on the other side, TSA guy holding both of them, looks at me and goes, what are these? And I was like, well, um, that's a dinosaur egg, and that's an Ica stone, it's an archaeological artifact. And he looked at the egg, looked at me, looked at the egg, looked at me, looked at the egg, and said, is he still in there? <laughs> 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 Only in Arkansas. <laughs> uh, oh, as I see it, we've got one final question that we need to tackle before I open it up for your questions. And that is, all right, if dinosaurs really existed and they walked with man, what happened to them? Now, I wish that I could just give you an answer and say, oh, well, the dinosaurs all died out because blank. But the answer is we don't know for sure. And there have been lots of animals that have, for whatever reason, gone extinct, died out. It's crazy. When you really look at all the different animals that we know used to exist, nobody ever asked me, like, hey, 
What happened to the saber-toothed tiger? Or the woolly? Everybody wants to know about the dinosaurs, right? The answer that your kids are going to get in the textbook is this one right here. An asteroid hit the earth. But that asteroid really, to me, causes more questions than it does solutions. Because think about this for just a minute. How do you selectively kill animals all over the planet from an asteroid on just one side? That doesn't work out real good for me. There are roughly 27 theories of what killed, 27 scientific theories. I brought five of them with me. The asteroid is always number one. Number two, uh, a nearby exploding star flooded the Earth with intense radiation, resulting in fatal mutations. Number three, the Earth was too warm, too cold, too dry, or too wet for the dinosaur's health. Number four, change in the dinosaur's diet resulted in weakened eggshells that broke after being laid. Sad to say, number five really is a scientific theory. And that is a laxative plant in the dinosaur's diet disappeared, and they all died of constipation. I will let you decide if that last one is possible, probable, or pitiful. Do I think I know what happened? Yeah, I do. I think our amazing God created a paradise environment that man and animals and God were to all be a part of. And I think in that environment, by the way, I can back up some of that with things like, oh, do you know what's buried under the ice in Antarctica? There's massive amounts of green plants, and they have one of the largest coal reserves on the planet. So we know things used to be different, right? And I think in that environment, I think dinosaurs thrive, by the way. Flip over and look with me at Genesis chapter 1, and let me back this up with a little bit of scripture. Look with me, verse 29 and 30 of Genesis chapter 1. God said, see, I have given you every herb that yield seed, which is on the face of all the earth, every tree whose fruit yield seed, to you it shall be for food. Also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food. And it was so. All right, so prior to the flood, what were both man and, and animals? We were vegetarian. All right, that ought to have some, some lights going off. Because th that helps me understand how man could coexist with dinosaurs without them eating them, right? They're vegetarian. Also helps me understand how Noah could get all the animals on the ark together because they're all vegetarian. It's not until Genesis chapter 9, verse 3. After the flood, God making his promise to Noah that he says this, Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I have given you all things even as the green herbs. So after the flood, God basically says, Fire up the barbecue, right? So think about this for just a minute. I think God created a paradise environment in which they thrived as vegetarians and then sin happened and if you know anything at all God did not just punish the serpent Adam and Eve the text says he also cursed the ground in fact that curse wasn't lifted until the flood so now we're in an environment that is not a paradise and lo and behold, he's about to wipe out every living thing that's not on that boat. What's it look like when, when something floods? I was actually talking to somebody earlier about the flood in St. Louis several years ago. We had a flood in Nashville many years ago, 18 inches in less than 24 hours. It was a big deal. But you ever thought about what it looks like when the water finally goes back into the banks? I mean, it's just muck and mire, right? I think the dinosaurs did make it, but I think a couple things happened. Number one, I think the flood kicked off an ice age, and if I had unlimited time, I would show you that. About 250 to 300 years post-flood. That limited where they could travel, because now we got the two poles are going to freeze up. 
So now they're limited because they're cold-blooded. I also think they didn't thrive after the flood because now we got a whole new weather pattern in place. But number two, what has man always done to animals we fear? We hunt them, we kill them. Imagine for just a minute, God tells Noah, now you can eat meat. We're 20 years after the flood. Noah rolls out of his tent and says, boys, go get us something to eat. Shem, Japheth, they, they jump up. They see a squirrel over here. For the young people in the room, squirrel. They see a possum. And they see a stegosaurus. And they look back over at that squirrel and they think, eh, he's small and greasy, he wouldn't feed everybody. They look at that possum and they think, eh, we'll leave him for the people in Arkansas. <laughs> they look at that stegosaurus and think, man, we could eat on that thing for weeks. Moms and dads in this room, here's the take-home message that I hope you'll get. And that is, our kids have lots of questions. Questions about animals like these, and it is critical that you show them the truth. Because if you don't, here's what's going to happen. They're going to compartmentalize. And they're going to keep coming to Bible class on Sundays and they're going to learn about Daniel in the lion's den and they're going to learn about Noah and the flood and baby Jesus in a man and all these different things. All the while they're hearing millions and billions and dinosaurs walked the earth long before man ever did and eventually something's going to give. And in too many cases, it's usually the Bible that they give up. Our kids the truth amen and this right here according to John 17 verse 17 is truth so I do hope and pray that as your kids are growing that you'll tell them hey if I don't know the answer that's okay we'll find it together but find them the answer I'm gonna pause right there here's what we're gonna do this evening I'm gonna say a, a quick prayer we're gonna go into Q&A and then afterwards, we'll let you do the devotional invitation. Is that right? All right. So if you guys will pray with me. Glorious God and Father, we thank you so much for allowing us this day to have life and to have breath. We acknowledge you as our creator, our sustainer. We thank you for this time that we've had to, to gather together as church family to study the evidence, and to remind ourselves that you are, in fact, our God. We thank you so much for the beauty of your creation. We thank you for the words in the Bible. Help us to not take any of it for granted, but rather help us to pass it on to our children, our grandchildren, and help us to leave a legacy of faith to you. Again, we thank you for the plan that you had in place before the beginning of this world, a plan that came at the cost of your son, and help us to not take that for granted. But rather, Heavenly Father, help us to reflect on the cross each and every day of our lives and to realize that we no longer serve the world, we serve you. We thank you for your word. Help us to always look to you for guidance and for strength. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. We'll do this kind of like we did last night. If you've got a question, a comment, fire away. Yes, sir. You asked the first one last night. Yeah. All right. Let me see if I can find my, there we go. I gotta find my, there's my mouse, okay. His question was, what about carbon-14 dating? By the way, just to tease the young people in this room, you need to go look at Job 41. 
What about carbon-14 dating? So the way carbon-14 dating works, uh, let me back up for right here. Basically, what, here's what happens. We take in a radioactive form of carbon, carbon-14, by the plants and the animals that we eat. So right now in your bodies, you've got carbon-14. Don't worry, it's not going to kill you. The theory is this, that that radioactive carbon breaks down at a very steady rate when you die. So let's say you die tomorrow. What they believe happens is you lose half of the carbon-14 in your body every 5,730 years. They call that the half-life. So every 5,730 years, you lose half of the amount of radioactivity in your fossils. So here, here's kind of a, a very generic way of, of thinking about it. If we found a bone, and that bone's got 10 radioactive units in it, and I've got 20. I've got 20, it's got 10, it's lost half. So that bone should be 5,730 years. Couple of problems with that theory. Number one, nobody's lived 5,730 years to know for sure that that's really the half-life. Number two, carbon dating is based on seven assumptions that all have to be true in order for the whole dating method to work, three of which we know there's problems with. Let me give you one just to chew on. Carbon-14, all radiometric dating demands that there's been uniformity since the beginning. No catastrophes, no issues. If there has been, that throws the whole dating off, and I'll, I'll give you an example. If we were fossilized tonight, okay, you're dead, sorry, you don't know who wins the playoff game, and a group up by Mount St. Helens dies the same night, a group over in Japan, we all die, all three groups, same night. They come back in 10,000 years, dig up our fossils. We should date the same, because we died at the same time, right? Anybody think that there could be more radioactivity around Mount St. Helens that they've been eating, that exposed to? Or what about over in Japan where they got a little radioactive spill going on, some problems? So they would actually have more carbon-14, which means we would date older than them even though we died the same night. See what? Okay, that's problem number one. Problem number two, and this one drives me crazy. I don't normally talk to the TV screen, but if you want to see me yell at a TV screen, show me some dumb news person with a dinosaur bone talking about how they have radio dated, radiometric dated that bone to be so many millions of years old. Folks, that's garbage. And let me show you why it's garbage. If I find a dinosaur fossil, and I take it into a lab, and I say, all right, how much carbon-14 is in there? And they say 37 units, right? How old is that dinosaur fossil? There's not a person on the planet that can tell you that answer. Because in order for somebody to tell you that answer, you have to know how much a living dinosaur had to know how much it's lost. They don't have that. We don't know if a living one had 3,700, 370, 3 point We don't know. The other issue is it doesn't take very long until you start cutting the number until you're at like 0 .00. Let me, let me show this to you. So let's say we found a, a, a bone that's got 10,000 units in it. I've got 20. That's 5,700 years. I'm going to use 5,000 because that's a lot easier on the math. So we'll say that's 5,000 years old. We cut that in half again. That means it's 10,000 years old with five radioactive units. Cut it in half again. We're now at 2.5 radioactive units. We're at roughly 15,000 years old. Cut it in half again. 1.75, we are at 20,000 years old. Cut it in half again. We're now in decimal points. And we're not even... 25,000 years old. Do you realize for something to be 65 million years old, the amount of radioactive carbon would be 0.0000 something. 
Which is why, by the way, Richard Dawkins himself, atheist, said different kinds of radioactive decay based geological stopwatches run at different rates. Radiocarbon stopwatches buzzes around at a great rate so fast after some thousands of years its spring is almost wound down. The watch is no longer reliable. Listen to what he says. It is useful for dating organic material on an archaeological or historical time scale where we're dealing in hundreds or a few thousand years, but it is no good for the evolutionary time scale where we're dealing in millions of years. So do I think that it's really accurate dating method? No, in fact, you may have seen me slide past these. These are peer-reviewed journals they have dated stuff, like a living mollusk, dated at 3,000 years old, keyword there, living mollusk. Um, I love this one. Muscle, muscle tissue from beneath the scalp of a mummified ox was radiocarbon dated at 24,000 years old. Hair from the hind limb of the same animal is dated at 7,200 years old. I figured that one out. He had a toupee on. So do I put a whole lot of stock in it? No. Good question. Other questions, comments? Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, so um, most of you, everybody in here, I'm, I'm about to ruin some kids' hopes and dreams right here. Everybody, you know, thinks of T-Rex as being this massive predator, rah, you know, it's going to get everything. They actually think it was more like a buzzard. Because if you stop and think about the arms of a T-Rex, it's not like he can run after you and grab you, right? So what they actually think he did was he waited around till somebody killed something, and then just politely walked up and said, um, that's mine. I'll eat that now. Because he didn't run and chase and grab with little bitty arms. Um, there have been actually a lot of things like that, that they're having to kind of go back and rethink. The one that they still haven't figured out, most of you in here have seen the really long-necked dinosaurs, you know, eating out of the treetops, Apatosaurus, those kinds of creatures. They don't think they did that anymore because they can't figure out how to get blood pressure up to the brain if that head was up above their body line. They think maybe they were just low grazers. So lots of stuff like that that's kind of coming out that they're going, eh, we may have got that wrong. Other comments, questions? Clean? Um, we don't read about a single creature in the Bible that would be considered clean that was reptilian or, or dinosaur-like. And so I would have to say we don't have that information. I don't think so. Um, if you look at all the animals that were used for sacrifice, Bible does a pretty good job of, of describing most of them, and so. Which, by the way, if you look back at the ark, he took a male and female of every kind, seven pair of the clean. Why would he take seven pair of the clean? What was the very first thing Noah did when he got off the boat? Yep. Which I'm gonna, I'm gonna really throw you for just a second. You guys, y'all don't know, so, okay, put yourself in my position for just a minute. I, I, I've studied this stuff, I love this stuff, and so my brain's up here doing this constantly, right, thinking, oh, you got to tell them this, you got to, and so I've got this, like, tsunami wave that I want to get across the whole time I'm fighting that dumb clock back there. I, I, I do want you to think about this for tomorrow morning. This will kind of hopefully get you mentally prepared. Genesis chapter 22. We've got Abraham offering up Isaac. And if you look at the text, it gives the exact spot where he's supposed to offer him up. And there's a, a beautiful, basically foreshadowing. 
in that particular thing where, uh, in fact, I'm going to read it to you. Um, God said, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, to the land of Moriah. Offer him there on a burnt offering. Um, so Mount Moriah, go offer your son. Fast forward several hundred years. Now we're going to build a temple. And we're going to have an altar where the priests are going to start offering things. You know where they put that? Moriah. So the same place where Abraham was offering up his son on a sacrifice, lo and behold, that's where they put the temple. And that's where they had sacrifice. Now fast forward another couple thousand years and guess what's in that same region today? Oh, that's Jerusalem where there was another sacrifice that was given that would be the last sacrifice, Jesus Christ. Do I think it's by accident? Nope. Other, other comments, questions, thoughts? Yes, sir. Okay, do I think there could still be dinosaurs around? Absolutely, I do. Um, I'm going to tell you a, something that happened to me that I can't. So one of the things hopefully you've noticed throughout as I talk, a lot of times I'll put references up. I, I'm really big about being able to back up everything because a lot of times I go into hostile territory, colleges and things, and, and I have to be able to, to back everything up. This one, I'm 100% sure it happened, but I didn't talk to the guy, and I can't reference it, so I don't use it. Uh, went to South Africa and was at the preaching school there just outside of Johannesburg. And one of the, the teachers there, he was telling me the story that happened where he was teaching the students. These are... South African bush guys who come in, they, they go through preaching school. He said he was teaching them through Job. He said, I got to Job chapter 40. I drew a dinosaur on the board. They had actual chalkboards back then, not dry erase. He said, I drew a, on the chalkboard a dinosaur. He said, one of my students walks in, looks at the board, says, oh, Makiki Mumbo, and goes and takes his seat. And the professor's like, what did, what? And he said, yeah, my granddad saw that. He said, what are you saying? And so he went on to, to give him this particular name of this thing. The guy looks it up. Sure enough, there have been several people who've cited this particular creature, including this guy's grandfather. Amazing story, really, really cool. Um, you asked, do I think we've seen everything? The Marianas Trench in the ocean, seven miles down. And we have definitely not explored all of that. Um, lots and lots of stuff. So do I think that there still could be some out there? Absolutely. Now I'm going to really keep you up tonight. Okay, You're going to think about this. What is the only creature that continues to grow throughout its lifespan? Reptile. Okay. All other creatures have a growth spurt. Then they plateau off. Humans, we grow from like 13 to 20, stop growing, and then we shrink a little bit at the end, right? Not true with reptiles. As long as a reptile is eating and breathing, it keeps growing. That's why some of these anacondas get really, 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 really big. Alligators, really, really big. All right, you take that fact. By the way, what would dinosaurs be classified as? Reptile. You take that fact... And you add in, how long were people living before the flood? Adam 930, Methuselah 969. You think a Komodo dragon could get kind of big in 900 years? So is it possible some of the creatures we got on the planet today, if given the right amount of time, could I? Yeah. You'll think about that. Any other questions, thoughts, comments? All right. Before I turn it over to you, tomorrow morning we start at 9.30. Seminar does not stop, okay? 
I know one or two of you, 10 to other congregations, you've told me that. That's okay. I'm not stealing sheep. Just show up here. In fact, if you're a preacher of another congregation, just go home, put a sign on the door, says, hey, we're meeting Sullivan Village. <laughs> 9.30 tomorrow morning, we are going to continue. Let me encourage you, if you can, be here, bring your children, bring your families, bring your friends. Um, I will tell you, during Bible class, we're going to look at the scientific accuracy of this book. Um, if it entices you, it's my wife's favorite lesson, and she's heard most all of them. During the worship hour, I hope to present to you a lesson that hopefully will impact your life and, Lord willing, change you forever. So I do hope you'll make plans to be with us. Uh, again, it has been a pleasure. I'll stick around for a while tonight. I'm going to turn it over. Something were to happen and you were not prepared to meet your maker. I started the evening off with talking about our salvation and how we must look into our salvation and take it extremely serious. And the three things I threw at you were that we should investigate, we should search out, and we should inquire thoroughly. Now that comes from Deuteronomy chapter 13 and verse 14. And it's actually talking about God's judgment and what will happen to these individuals if they do not follow his commandments. Then you shall investigate and search out and inquire thoroughly if it is true and the matter established that this abomination has been done among you, you shall surely strike the inhabitants of that city with the edge of the sword, utterly destroying it and all that is in it and its cattle with the edge of the sword. This is a finality to that city. It was never to be built upon again. That was God's judgment and his command. We have heard some amazing, amazing information here tonight. And anyone that has looked into this and studied it was leaning toward these conclusions already. Take it to mind and do not be ashamed to tell people on the street that yes, dinosaurs and humans did coexist. If you have any need of coming forward and letting us help you with uh, some problem that you may have, brothers and sisters, we encourage you to do that if you need to be baptized. We ask that you would do that as together we stand and sing. Consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the star, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe display. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us this evening to come together to hear more about you, your creation. Lord, we thank you for Brother Brad to bring us this lesson. And we especially thank you for the leadership of this congregation to put in this gospel meeting together. Lord, we thank you for all of our members and especially for the guests that are here with us tonight. Lord, we know we are sinners and we thank you so much for your son, Jesus Christ, that he came to this earth to uh, die on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. Lord, as we depart here tonight, keep us safe until we meet again the next point in time. Forgive us our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.